People believe that these things are absolutely true. I keep getting them left, therefore, as comments on my channel. I was asked about them during an interview I did on local radio just last month. And bizarrely, they came up in great detail at the dinner party I was at this week. Things that people believe they know as fundamental truths about cruising, but are they right? I'm going to talk about whether there's any truth in these things. If you're new here, welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge, and it's my goal to make it fun and easy to discover, plan, and enjoy unforgettable cruise vacations. Before we get into some of the heavier topics, let's start with one of the obvious ones. As I'm in my early 60s and I cruise a lot, I possibly prove the long-held belief that people have that cruising is for newlyweds and the nearly dead. However, CLEAR, which is the Cruise Line Association, their data shows that the average age of cruising is falling. And the average age is actually 47 years old globally. It's a little bit older in places like the UK. And this is because families with kids are now cruising in greater and greater numbers. Now, half the cruisers are admittedly over the age of 60, and they're still a really big part of it. But we're seeing a shift down in age, and we're seeing two major cruise types reflecting this trend in ages. First of all, there's the mass cruising on resort lines. Many young couples, groups of friends and families use these. It includes lines like Carnival, Royal Caribbean, Norwegian Cruise Line, MSC Cruises, and I guess also Disney. These offer relaxed cruising. They have many resort attractions for all ages. It could include water parks, ice skating, video arcades, go-karting. They have a huge choice of dining, lots of options for everybody from fine dining through to hamburgers and fast food. Their excursions include active and family options. Most have a wide range of cabins for all budgets. So they've got inexpensive inside cabins, which appeal to people on a budget or younger people, through to big family suites. They're not strict on dress codes. And this category appeals to a much more youthful crowd. And these seem to be a big driver, if not the main driver, in bringing the average age of cruising down because they're bringing all those people into cruising. Now, the second category are the premium and the luxury cruise lines. Now, these do tend to cater much more for traditional cruising demographic like me, for example. So you'll mostly find over 50s, 60s, 70s, significantly fewer families and younger couples. They have no or have much smaller kids clubs and programs, so they also don't talk to those people either. They have a much more traditional cruise program. So you're going to see quizzes, enrichment talks, cooking demonstrations, and so on. They're much stricter on their dress codes. The excursions, they tend to be more cultural, more kind of perhaps beach chill out excursions. Now, the premium lines, which are in this kind of group, include Princess, Honda America, Celebrity, Cunard, Oceania, Viking, and so on. More traditional cruise ships, they don't have resort features. You've also then got luxury lines that also cater for this group, Seabourn, Silver Sea, Region 7 Sea, Ritz-Carlton Yacht Club, and I guess European lines like Ponant, and maybe to a lesser degree, Hapag Lloyd. Now, there are some exceptions in this premium category emerging, like Virgin Voyages, which are coming into this category, but they're trying to have a much more youthful approach, talk to a slightly younger audience, which may also help bring the age of cruising down, but also start to shift premium cruising into talking to a younger audience. So being for old people is definitely overstated. It's not a fact in cruising, and it's changing fast, despite what people believe. It's also not for stuffy, unadventurous travelers who just want a holiday camp-style vacation. While, of course, I can choose and you can choose to do that, I personally don't see myself as a stuffy, unadventurous traveler. For example, I've been on expedition cruising to the Arctic and Antarctica. I've been on a seven-week segment of the world cruise calling on really out-of-the-way unusual places. I've been to Iceland. I've been to French Polynesia. I've been right around Japan. You can cruise to incredibly out-of-the-way places. It's not all about a holiday camp at sea seeking out the sun. But this does raise one of the biggest beliefs that people have about cruising the how cruising happens. 4,000 people on the high seas is my idea of a nightmare. This is a comment that people have about cruising and they believe that cruising is all about these big, massive 4,000, 5,000 passengers. I don't want to spend my vacation with thousands of people and I don't have to. 
Many people associate cruising with those big resort ships that are sailing out of particularly Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Port Canaveral, heading to the Caribbean and around parts of the Mediterranean. And they therefore think, because that's very visual, that's what they see, that that is all there is. There are around 300 cruise ships in operation, and those ships are a very small percentage of that 300. There are broadly speaking about five categories that ships are placed in based on size. And although definitely the trend is to more and more big ships by many of the lines, there are still five categories of ships. You know, there are ships that take under 800 passengers, Seaborne, Silver Sea, Azamara, part of the Oceania fleet. You've got these sort of more small mid-sized ships that take 800 to 1,500. Crystal, Viking Cruises, Saga. You've then got ships that are perhaps up to 2,500 passengers, the Cunard, some of the Holland America fleet, some of the celebrity fleets have. And then you finally get to those big 3,500 plus mega ships. There's a lot of choice of size of ship within those 300 cruise ships. You don't have to cruise with thousands of people. Cruising isn't just about big, massive ships. Before I cruised, I thought this thing that people say about cruising was true as well. The belief that normal people are going to feel trapped and bored on a cruise ship. Now let's just look at that from a logical perspective first. We are actually not on the ship long enough to feel trapped or get bored. Most cruisers are port intensive and they spend almost all of the day in port. So usually a ship gets to port around eight o'clock in the morning and it stays in port until five o'clock or six o'clock in the evening. So between 6 p.m. and 8 a.m. is the only time you're actually going to be on the ship. And in that limited time, you've got a sailaway party. You've got to get ready for dinner. You're going to go to dinner, have a big multi-course dinner. You're then going to go to a show or you're going to go and watch some other entertainment like live music. And then you're going to sleep. So you're going to cram all that into that amount of time. There's just simply not enough time to feel trapped or bored. In fact, you're more likely to, as I am when I get off a cruise, be frustrated because you haven't had enough time to do everything on the ship. Ships have so much to do. They have so many venues, so much going on that you just physically can't do everything that you're going to want to do in the limited time you're on the ship. There's also a strong belief and a strong concern that cruising is dangerous, that people fall off the ship all the time and there's a lot of crime. So let's tackle that falling off a ship first. Around 20 to 25 people at most do go missing off a ship every year. That's out of around 29 million passengers that cruise every year. And bear in mind, at any point in time, there's also around 300,000 crew on those various cruise ships as well. People who go overboard have either jumped off the ship or done something foolish like standing up or jumping around on the railings. Ships have really high railings you can't accidentally slip and fall off a ship. Now, sadly, people who've gone overboard have usually done it deliberately. But what about crime? One of the reasons it is definitely such a contentious topic, and many feel it's a hidden problem, is there is no central global database of crime that occurs on a ship. And there's also concerns around jurisdiction and what has to be reported, and basically the belief that crime is underreported on ships. There's no police force as such on a ship, you only have security. There is, by the way, as a little aside, a prison, it's called a brig on cruise ships. Now we can get a sense of the amount of crime that happens on a cruise ship because crimes that happen on sailings on ships that originate, that are starting or ending in the United States, they have to be reported to the FBI under the Cruise Vessel Security and Safety Act of 2020. And every single quarter, an incident report appears on the US Department of Transport website. And it's split by crime, including things like homicide, suspicious death, missing people, assault, theft of over $10,000, and sexual assault. A criminologist, Dr. James Fox, is very well known for publishing a study of all this data. And he basically says that the rates of violent crime on cruise ships is about 95% lower than you're gonna find in an average US city. I looked at the data on the Department of Transportation website. It shows around about 30 to 40 reported crimes per quarter on those ships selling out of the United States. I can see though that the biggest crime that's reported is actual sexual assaults. This is around 25 or so a quarter. And it's really important to know that cruise ships 
have extensive CCTV and every area except cabins and private spaces like public restrooms are monitored. So while the level of crime compared to the millions traveling is still relatively low, any crime is a traumatic experience and it's a reminder to not let our guard down on any vacation, including a cruise. Cruising is not a crime-free zone. It's a low crime zone, but it still has crime. Many people fundamentally believe that cruise lines are bad for the ocean because they dump waste and sewage into the sea. And in fact, that used to be the case decades ago. Pretty much all waste did end up in the ocean. But even the current rules for many may seem a little bit shocking. The MARPOL 4 convention, which came out in the 2000s, it affects all ships, not just cruise ships. And it specifically talks about sewerage. And it says that, wait for it, that when a ship is over 12 miles from land and cruising at four knots, a ship can release untreated sewerage into the ocean. Between three and 12 miles, it can only release sewerage after it's been through an approved treatment process and system. And within three miles of land or less than three miles, ships can't release anything into the ocean. So theoretically, cruise ships can release untreated sewerage into the ocean once they're 12 miles from land. Now that's pretty scary because when you think about the number of ships and the amount of people, and the amount of sewage that's created, it's a lot. The US Environmental Protection Agency, they estimate, for example, in a week-long cruise of 3,000 people, so say 2,000 passengers, 1,000 crew, 150,000 gallons of sewage is created. That's about 10 large backyard swimming pools. It's an enormous amount of sewage that could be going into the ocean. Now, the good news is that the cruise lines do not follow these rules. CLEAR, which is the Global Cruise Line Association and all the lines, they've agreed slightly different rules, which all the cruise lines have to follow. And they've agreed they will only release sewage if it's actually been through that complex treatment process once they're 12 miles out. So on cruise ships, the sewage, which is actually known as black water, it goes through this complicated four-stage process, which involves ultraviolet treatments, various screens and so on, and it gets it down to a water which is basically compatible with the ocean. Now, I was pretty skeptical about that until I saw the process myself and what gets released into the ocean. The way I did that, I went on backstage tour. You can pay to do those on the various cruise lines. And I've actually made a video with much more details about this whole process if you want to find out more about this. Now, the maritime rules say that other waste cannot be released into the ocean. So ships now have an environmental office on board who oversees all of this and manages the activities like the recycling process. You know, glass is sorted by color, it's ground down, metal is compacted, paper is also done, the same happens to paper. And then these are offloaded import their sold to various recycling companies. So really kind of strict rules on what ships can and can't do. If the lines are caught breaking any of these rules, the fines are huge. And unfortunately, one or two lines have been caught out and fined. Now, if you're skeptical about that, again, I recommend going on one of those behind the scene tours and actually see the environment process and practice firsthand. Also, follow Friends of the Earth because they have a cruise line environmental scorecard where they track cruise ships on how well they perform on waste and pollution. But before you do that, why not find out what drives cruise passengers crazy about other cruise passengers by watching this video, where I'm gonna start off talking about what causes more fights than any other between cruise passengers. See you over there.